Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. A 3Y0I Bovey Island D expedition has been revived. Well, sort of. A radio amateur is named to be the next president of the Harvard University. Activity is quoted as being awesome for the 2018 ARRL International Grid Chase so far this year. The Z60A operation has moved Kosovo down the most wanted list a few notches. Sony has announced that it will cease production of shortwave radio receivers. A fine of $50,000 or jail time is imposed on an amateur operator in Trinidad. And three-dimensional printed objects can now communicate without any onboard electronics. We'll tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, reminisces about user groups, asks, why do equipment manufacturers insist on ultra-bright LED power lights and about his problems with drones. Australia's own Anna Benshop, VK6FLAB, asks, how should you promote your contest? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with a brand new segment on operating amateur radio from your hospital room and its possible pitfalls to avoid. And we will have a talk given by Vermont DXer Mitch Stern, W1SJ, at the 2017 Hamvention on how to crack pileups on the HF bands. That's all straight ahead as edition number 990 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in gray, overcast, raw, upstate New York, I guess that's the meteorological term that they use, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains in New York State, where the maple sap is flowing and the buckets are overflowing, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news comes word that peripatetic Polish de-expeditioner Dom Grzyb, 3Z9DX, and four other operators announced over the weekend that their postponed plans to mount the 3Y0I de-expedition to Bovet Island are back on. This comes as the 3Y0Z de-expedition team members, who were unsuccessful earlier this month in landing on the remote South Atlantic Island, are currently en route to South Africa on their way back home. According to the latest Clublog DXCC Most Wanted list, Bovet is the second most wanted DXCC entity behind North Korea. Our trip, planned originally at the end of 2017, was canceled at the request of the organizers of the 3Y0Z expedition, an announcement said. Due to the cancellation by the 3Y0Z organizers, we are now returning to the implementation of our project and preparations for our trip as a matter of urgency. DX World has reported that the 3Y0I license has been renewed and a landing permit, good for one year, issued by the Norwegian Polar Institute. While no specific dates for the de-expedition have been announced, the 3Y0I team said its plans call for operating during the sub-Antarctic summer, which suggests they could be on the air later this year. The 3Y0I team said it has chartered a seagoing yacht adapted for extreme weather conditions to make the 12-day, 2,800 nautical mile trip from South Africa to Bovet Island. The team anticipates operating for about two weeks. The participants have financed the trip out of their own pockets. Lawrence F. Bacow, KA1FZQ, of Brookline, Massachusetts, has been selected to become the 29th president of Harvard University, the home of W1AF. Selected from a field of some 700 candidates, McCow will take office July 1st, succeeding Drew Faust. 
Larry Bacow is one of the most accomplished, admired, insightful, and effective leaders in American higher education, said William F. Lee, chair of the Presidential Search Committee, in making the announcement over the weekend. This is a pivotal moment for higher education, a time full of extraordinary possibilities to pursue new knowledge, enhance education, and serve society, but also a time when the singular value of higher education and university research has too often been challenged and called into doubt. Such a time calls for skillful leadership, strategic thinking, and disciplined execution. Larry will provide just that. The son of immigrants and holding three degrees from Harvard, including a Ph.D. in public policy, Bacow has a long-time faculty leader at MIT, his undergraduate alma mater, where he rose to the position of chancellor. He also served for a decade as the president of Tufts University, currently is Hauser Leader in Residence at Harvard Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership. In a Temple Emanuel from the Gates Newsletter commentary last November, McCall confessed to being an uber nerd while he was growing up in Pontiac, Michigan. I was a ham operator, he said. I used to get my kicks from building radios from Heathkits. Some of you old timers are old enough to remember them. McCall said his reading outside of school was confined to popular science, popular mechanics, scientific American, and some obscure magazines known only to fellow ham operators as QST and 7-3. ARRL Roanoke Division Vice Director Bill Marine, N2COP, said he once worked Bacow on two meters when the Akamadician was sailing off the coast of Maine many years ago after Bacow was named the president of Tufts, Marine's alma mater. Larry's a great guy and is supportive of ham radio, Marine told ARRL. Bacow's father, Mitchell, was also a radio amateur operator, W8JYZ and N4MB. He died in 2007. On-the-air activity for the 2018 AWRL International Grid Chase has been awesome. AWRL Contest Branch Manager Bart Yonke, W9JJ, said this week. The year also began with de-expeditions, as well as several contests at both HF and VHF, which helped boost the numbers. Facebook and social media are abuzz with chatter about the event, the excitement, and the grids worked. Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, is covering this story at League Headquarters and files this report. Carla? According to ARRL Contest Branch Manager Bart Yonke, W9JJ, on the air activity for the 2018 ARRL International Grid Chase has been phenomenal. Yonke said the statistics show the highest overall activity on 40 and 20 meters, not surprising in the winter, and a particularly high level of digital activity. He expects phone and CW activity to perk up this month and next with the ARRL International DX Contest CW Weekend February 17 and 18 and the Phone Weekend March 3 and 4. He also anticipates that February's statistics will come on strong as participants rework January grid squares to boost their February scores. As of midweek, some 23,300 station sites were active in the IGC. Yankee said it's apparent that participants are taking advantage of CW, FT8, and other digital modes on HF, FT8, JT65, and FSK144, MSK144 on 6 meters and above. Several contests in January, including the ARRL RTTY Roundup and the ARRL January VHF contest, contributed to these strong phone and digital numbers. During January, Grid Chase eligible contacts matched in Logbook of the World top 22,000 on 40 meters and 23,000 on 20 meters, the two bands with the greatest activity, with nearly half the contacts being made on digital modes in both bands. On the new 630 meter band, 31 contacts turned up in Logbook of the World. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. The leaderboard reporting system continues to evolve with much helpful participant feedback, Yankee said. That user input is improving how the ARRL reports participation. From the statistics, it's clear that during this period of low sunspots and low winter E skip in F2, most of the activity on the mid to lower bands is digital modes, Yankee said. As we get into the summer E skip season, we expect to see activity above 15 meters begin its ascent in the totals. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. What a difference a week makes. 
The ongoing Z60A special operation to celebrate the addition of Kosovo to the DXCC list and Kosovo's 10th anniversary of independence appears to have put a big dent in demand for the new entity, which briefly stood at the top of the heap. According to Club Log's DXCC Most Wanted list as of February 14th, the Republic of Kosovo now is in the number 8 position after rocketing into the number 1 slot when it became a DXCC entity on January 21st. The number 2 and number 3 slots are held by Bovet Island and Crozet Island, respectively, while North Korea is back at number 1. Nominations will be accepted until March 1st for the membership in the CQ Amateur Radio, DX, and CQ Contest Halls of Fame. The DX and Contest Halls of Fame recognize radio amateurs who have made major contributions to DXing and contesting, respectively. The CQ Amateur Radio Hall of Fame recognizes those who have made major contributions to amateur radio in general and radio amateurs who have made major contributions to society at large. The activities and accomplishments that qualify one for membership in these elite groups involve considerable personal sacrifice and can usually be described by the phrase above and beyond the call of duty. The nomination announcement said nominations may be made by individuals, clubs, or national organizations. Up to two people may be inducted into the contest and DX Halls of Fame each year. There is no set maximum for inductees into the Amateur Radio Hall of Fame. Email nominations or mail postmarked by March 1st to Amateur Radio DX or Contest Hall of Fame, care of CQ Magazine, 17 West John Street, Hicksville, New York, 11801 USA. Be sure to specify which Hall of Fame you're making the nomination for. An amateur radio operator in Trinidad and Tobago must pay a $50,000 fine or face five years in jail for unlicensed radio transmissions in 2007, which was before he was licensed. Desi Lee Bunter, a master certified electronics technician, has testified during his trial that he was in the process of repairing the transmitters when police visited his home 11 years ago and found the equipment. He was found guilty of operating without a license from his home. At the time, his attorney had asked for leniency for his client, who was eventually granted a license by the Telecommunications Authority. His attorney noted at the time that Von Ter, an extra-class license holder in the United States, is also an American Red Cross volunteer and a member of the Radio Emergency Association Citizen Team, or REACT. His QRZ page lists his U.S. call sign from a New Jersey address at N2DLB. Although Von Ter won his case in Magistrate's Court, the Telecommunications Authority appealed, and the judges ruled that the prosecution had proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. According to a recent report in the Trinidad and Tobago Newsday, Bonter must pay the fine within 90 days or face time in prison. ARRL this week announced a mobile DXCC operating award available to radio amateurs who have contacted at least 100 DXCC entities from a working vehicle with antennas and power source capable of operating while in motion. ARRL Radio Sport Manager Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, advised those pursuing the award to put safety first. Full official details are on the Mobile DXCC Operating Award page. The Mobile DXCC is a one-time award and is non-endorsable. Contacts made any time in the past do count toward the award. QSLs are required, but you do not need to submit them. Mobile stations may use any legal power for the entity from which they are operating. This award specifically excludes contacts made by aeronautical or maritime mobile stations. Also, you do not have to be an ARRL member to qualify for this award. Because Mobile DXCC is similar to the QRP DXCC Operating Award, ARRL has redesigned the QRP DXCC certificate so that the two awards complement one another. Operators who hold the QRP DXCC award may apply for the new style certificate with the original date of issue printed on the certificate, but you do not have to resubmit QSL cards or a log. All certificates are $16. AWRL has received from Lynn Burlingame, N7CFO, the donation of a Kilbourne and Clark Morse key that the late Howard Mason used to let the world know that Rear Admiral Richard Byrd and his crew had overflown the South Pole for the first time during Byrd's 1928-1930 Antarctic expedition.
With more on this story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX, reporting from AWRL headquarters in Newington. Mason and his 80 colleagues were awarded Congressional Gold Medals for their efforts in establishing the Antarctic Outpost Little America, the first of a series of bases bearing that name. Mason was a lifelong radio amateur from Seattle who was an active ARRL National Traffic System participant and manager. In 1923, he relocated to Connecticut to serve as an editor of the league's journal QST. Mason's first polar experience was as a radio operator with the Wilkins Detroit News Arctic Expedition that traversed the North Pole by air in 1928. This led to his selection by Byrd to be a radio engineer with his first Antarctic expedition. Mason was co-operator of Little America's base radio station WFA, used to keep in contact with the rest of the world. The ARRL Heritage Museum plans to display the key as part of an exhibition tentatively scheduled to open on April 15th. The exhibition also will include a large wooden key engraved with WFA and bearing the signatures of some expedition members. Also on display will be a first edition of Admiral Byrd's book, Little America, Aerial Exploration in the Antarctic, The Flight to the South Pole, both part of the Burlingame donation. A complete narrative will be posted to the Heritage Museum section of the AWRL website. The key and the Little America radio operators can be seen in action in an original film available on YouTube, which offers a first look at the towers erected there. A rising star in the amateur radio world, 19-year-old Ruth Willett, KM4LAO of Lawrenceville, Georgia, has caught the eye of her school, Kettering University in Michigan, where she's majoring in mechanical engineering and engineering physics. Willett has already attracted attention through her ham radio activities. Last spring, she was the keynote speaker at the 32nd annual DX Dinner, held in conjunction with Hamvention, where her topic was experiencing the hobby of a lifetime. Previous summer, she was a member of the 2016 Dave Calter Memorial Youth DX Adventure, which operated from the island of Saba that year. Last year, she won the QST Cover Plaque Award for the article she wrote about her YDXA experience. At the 30th Hamvention Youth Forum in 2017, Willett spoke on plugging into your valuable club resources. She is the recipient of the AWRL Rocky Mountain Division Scholarship. Kettering University News took notice of Willett on a February 12th article. Kettering University student brings ham radio hobby expertise to the campus by Sarah Sush. The article explains how an early fascination with Morse code led Willett into ham radio and inspired her to obtain her license in 2015. She now holds an amateur extra class license. I would encourage people to consider exploring amateur radio because it's a hobby that allows you to explore anything from technical electronics to international friendships, Willett is quoted in the article. It's such a special hobby because there are so many people that want to get to know you and want to help you learn and grow. It's really enabled me to mature into who I am today. Set to graduate in 2021, Willett said her ham radio experiences have taught her a lot, some of which she's able to apply to her studies and vice versa. She hopes to start an amateur radio club on campus this spring to get more students interested in the article. She also pointed out that amateur radio's public service role, citing the devastating 2017 hurricanes, where ham radio sometimes was the only available communications resource. Ruth Willett and her mom, Sharon, KM4TVU, participated in AWRL's highly successful National Parks on the Air event in 2016, which also was mentioned in the Kettering article. It's a stress relief for me, said Willett in the article. I really enjoy sharing this hobby with other students. A team from NBC News's Nascent Digital News Unit left field was in Hawaii to visit with some radio amateurs to produce a report when the false nuclear missile alert happened on January 13th. Left Field's report points out how much we rely on cell phones and 21st century technology and what we would do if these suddenly were no longer available. Amateur radio operators are standing at the ready and may save us all, NBC Left Field said in the tease to its YouTube version of its report. Accessible directly from NBC News, the report with Left Field's Jacob Sorboff runs a little over seven minutes. Ham radio is one of the ways you'd be able to hear what's happening when conventional telecommunications systems fail, Sorboff told his viewers. Among those interviewed in the piece are AWRL section manager Joe Speroni, AH0A, and section emergency coordinator Kevin Bogan, AH6QQ. 
NBC News says its left field unit is a new internationally minded video troupe that makes short creative documentaries and features specially designed for social media and set top boxes. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The internet is abuzz with Sony Japan declaring in January that they ended the production of its ICF SW35 shortwave receiver. They also declared in February that they end the sales of another shortwave receiver, ICF 7600GR, at their online store. Probably they will declare the end of its production soon. ICS FW35 has been on sale since 2000, ICF 7600GR since 2001. This means Sony will completely withdraw from the shortwave receiver market. Remaining Sony shortwave receivers are ICF EX5MK2 and the ICF M7080N. Both are exclusively for the reception of Radio Nikkei, tunable only to six fixed shortwave frequencies of Radio Nikkei, Japan. A Soyuz rocket launched D-Star-1 Phoenix and 10 other satellites into orbit on February 1st from the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia. Developed by German Orbital Systems in Berlin in cooperation with the Czech company iSky Technology, D-Star-1 Phoenix carries an amateur radio relay payload with a call sign of DP-1GOS. It replaces D-Star-1 nano satellite that failed to attain orbit following a November Soyuz launch from Bastochny. Downlink frequencies are 435.700 MHz for telemetry and 435.525 MHz for D-Star. The uplink is 437.325 MHz. D-Star 1 Phoenix is a 3U CubeSat equipped with four identical radio modules with D-Star capability, operating in half-duplex mode with a power output of 800 milliwatts. The two telemetry and telecommand modules both receive and both in sequence, so each telemetry frame is repeated. The other two modules are dedicated to amateur radio, although only one will operate at a time. The modules are configured to work as D-Star repeaters, so they retransmit received D-Star frames on the downlink frequency. They also have a D-Star voice beacon. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. We have to tell you about another satellite to be launched. It is S-Hail 2, and the current launch date is estimated to be March 28th from Cape Canaveral. This will be the very first amateur satellite launched aboard a geostationary satellite operating in the S-band and X-band via its AMSAT DL hosted payload. Before you get too itchy to work this new satellite, you better have a plane ticket ready. There are commercial payloads on the satellite. There are 24 KU band and 11 KA band transponders for direct broadcasting services throughout the Middle East and North Africa. There are also government communication services. That's why I said have a plane ticket ready. This satellite has a footprint on the other side of the globe. Thanks to the AMSAT News Service for this story. Recently launched satellite that was object 43199 has been identified as Xiaonyan Zing or YouthSat. It is identifying itself as MXSat-1 and not on its coordinated frequencies. Hopefully now that the satellite is identified, the amateur transponder will be turned on. Thanks to the AMSAT News Service for this story as well as Nico, PA0DLO. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Foundations of Amateur Radio The act of telling someone about something is promoting it, not in a marketing sense, just an awareness sense. The act of not telling someone is keeping a secret. Radio amateurs, and I have no doubt people who are not, like to plan things. They set up contests, on-air activities, organise swap meets, build websites, write articles, invent things, build stuff, and all manner of other amazing activities. Some amateurs talk about what they've been up to, but most just sit quietly, hoping that their brilliance will be discovered by someone. Of course, that rarely happens. Let's imagine a contest. It's an activity that you'd ideally want other amateurs to participate in. Talking to yourself, 
on your own is like being a broadcaster, and I can tell you that's a tough gig. A contest is about making contacts between different participating people. So your contest, it's going to have rules, a planned outcome, say more QRP activity on 40 meters, and it's going to run at a particular time. I've lost count of the times where that's the sum total of effort put into organizing a contest. Of course, the contest flops since no one knew about it, and often that's the end of it. So what can you do to actually get a head start in making this contest work? For starters, you should figure out who the audience for this contest is. If you set it up on 160 meters and aim for beginners, you'll have a problem since they're not allowed on that band. So the audience is based on the rules of the contest. And of course, one influences the other. Once you've got a defined audience, and no, all the amateurs on the planet is not a valid audience, since by that metric you could also say all the taxi drivers in New York City, and while that is a defined group, it's unlikely that you'll find much in the way of participation in your amateur radio contest. That's not to say that there isn't a New York cabbie who isn't also an amateur, hi, but their amateur status is not the same as their taxi driver's status. So pick an actual defined audience. The more defined, the better. Let's say for a moment that your audience is amateurs who've been in the hobby less than a year who live within a thousand kilometers of you. Now your task is to figure out how you're going to talk to them, what you're going to say, and how you're going to encourage them to be part of this wonderful contest. You could target the local amateur schools and ask them to send out an email on your behalf to promote your contest. Or you could approach the local radio clubs and ask them to promote your thing to their new members. You could seek out local radio nets that cater for new amateurs. You could write articles for the local radio magazine, or you could post comments on your favorite social media outlet. None of these things are particularly difficult, onerous, or complex but not doing them means that your contest is doomed before it starts. So now you have an audience and some outlets for communication. What do you say? I've seen contest promotions that list the frequencies and link to the rules. That's it. Not very inspiring. I've seen promotions that state that they're aimed at a particular audience, but the rules indicate that you'll need to have a particular license in order to participate because the bands or modes exclude the audience. All these messages achieve is the opposite of promotion. People know to avoid this contest rather than feel inspiration to participate. So what should your message be? First of all, it should be written one on one. You're listening to me right now. The fact that there are other people also listening is not relevant to you. Every communication is like this. Everyone experiences communication as a message to themselves, to their needs, emotions, desires, motivation. Just me and you, talking. Of course, there are messages intended for a stage, but this is not one of them. We're not in Wembley Stadium, and I'm not on stage encouraging everyone to wave their hands in the air right now. So, write your message to a single person. The better you can imagine that person, the better the message works. The information in the message needs to be heard, so you need to find a way to relate to the person listening. It needs to resonate in some way. You need to be able to elect a no or a yes from the person listening. There's a contest that encourages you to set up a Jolly Roger and speak like a pirate on air, simply to find something that makes it stand out and be memorable. Your message needs to do that, stand out and be memorable. The first place to look is inside yourself. What would make you want to do this contest? What would motivate you? How would you benefit from this contest? What would you gain? So find an audience, figure out how to talk to them, determine what you want to say, and then do it. Of course, this doesn't just apply to a contest. It applies to courses, to radio clubs, to swap meets, to technical talks, anything you want to have people come and play. What are you waiting for? Amateur radio promotion isn't hard, but you have to actually do it. 
I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha Bravo. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. A little bit of rock and roll. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's talk tech, you and me. We are having a fun time. This is like a little user group here. That's kind of always what I thought of this radio show as being uh, a chance for. That's what user groups were. In the very earliest days of computers, companies really didn't give you any help or support. And so computer lovers who were in many cases building their own computers got together in uh, Silicon Valley, in Berkeley, California, in Boston. And the big user groups were born. And there were some amazing ones. Of course, the Homebrew Computer Club is where the Apple was introduced. The Apple One, Steve Woz, Wozniak and uh, Steve Jobs were members they showed it there. Steve Wozniak sold kits for the first Apple One to the Homebrew Computer Club, and there, in the in the heyday of user groups, I'm thinking of the Berkeley Macintosh Users Group, and there was one in Boston too. There would they would have meetings uh, with hundreds of people, and vendors uh, would would you know kill to go there and show off their stuff, and they were, they were so much fun. I think. B Mug was every it was like a third Thursday of the month, and it was just an amazing event to go to. But members of the users group aged out. The young people, I guess, just didn't feel the need with modern technology. There's no, you know, Snapchat user group. <laughs> they have their own user groups. They talk amongst themselves. I don't know. And so they're they tend to be shrinking. They tend to be aging. And I think they're still very useful. But in a way, that's what we do here. We help each other. It hasn't changed much. Technology is still hard to use. Companies still don't really give you much help. And so that's what we're doing. We get together and we help our, help each other. Anybody in my position has a room full of junk. I was talking to a listener a couple of weeks ago. He said, I imagine your house just got wires and, 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 and plugs and things everywhere. And I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. My, 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 my long-suffering wife will, tolerates it as long as I keep it in certain precincts. So, you know, in the, in the living room, no. Well, a little bit. The real problem actually in our house is not wires so much as LED lights. Everything, it seems like everybody who designs one of these things has to put an LED or two on it. And uh, Lisa, my wife, really likes to sleep in the dark. So I spent a lot of time uh, light proofing the room, going around putting tape. They actually make special LED tape that uh, you can get a variety of different darknesses to uh, to make it so that it's invisible, completely dark. Actually, electrical tape, would, something like that would work. Or if you want to see it, but it's want to dim it, they have different, different levels of dimming. <laughs> Crazy. I was just talking about you and your intolerance of light. Lisa's right here. And, and how our house is full. We are. Our house is full of LED lights, and I have to be very careful to keep them out of sight. Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? I want to uh, tip a hat to uh, somebody that some of you will know, uh, certainly a, a guy I really revere and admire who passed away uh, yesterday at the age of 84. His name is Jerry Pornell. And if uh, if you go back away in the, the days of, uh, the earliest days of personal computing, Jerry was at Byte Magazine, the author of a column called Chaos Manor that was in many ways the inspiration for me and what I do, and really a whole generation of tech journalists. The thing that was new and different about Jerry's column, Chaos Manor, is uh, he wrote uh, about using technology, I think it was computers back then pretty much exclusively, wrote about using computers from the user's point of view. And that really was kind of new. He talked about what it was like to set up a computer, his problems with, in the early days, CPM and DOS and, and you know, electric pencil and WordPerfect, the old programs. He talked about, he named his computers. I remember Ezekiel, his uh, Z80 computer. And he wrote about them in a, in a folksy, friendly, but in, informed way that I, I think for a whole generation of us uh, excited us about computing 
and 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 made us feel like we knew Jerry and what it was like to be Jerry, and he was one of us. He, of course, was better known in the outside world as a great science fiction author. He wrote with Larry Niven some of the most important science fiction novels of our time, including Lucifer's Hammer, uh, some really mote in God's eye, some really inspiring science fiction, which, which is today still considered classic and well worth reading if you haven't read any of Jerry's uh, works with Larry Niven. A great guy, a great writer, a great friend, and an inspiration for all of us who cover technology. And he will certainly be missed. Uh, Jerry Pornell passed away quietly, according to his son. Uh, Alex posted on his website, Chaos Manor, that he was uh, he went to he went to Dragon Con, had a great time, the big science fiction convention, and uh, passed away uh, painlessly and quietly. So, um, a great guy. And if you do know the name and you remember him, um, maybe you know tip of the hat to Jerry Pornell, who is probably building PCs in the sky. I did finally, you know, I have a bad history with drones, bad history with drones. First drone I bought, my uh, my friend, Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, who we call the quad father because he's such a drone fanatic. He said, Leo, don't buy an expensive drone. You'll just lose it and crash it. And we, you know, for the studio, we had a DJI Phantom, one of the first. We used it for, you know, kind of helicopter style shots and so forth. But... um he said, you know, you're going to crash, so get a $40 SEMA drone. You can get them on Amazon, S-Y-M-A. They're cheap. That way, if you crash it, you won't feel so bad. So I took his advice, and I was so excited that first time. I charged up the batteries, got out the remote control, read the instructions carefully, put the SEMA, turned it on, put the drone down on the, you know, these, these those four-blade quadcopters. They're really amazing because they're very stable platforms. You control them with your smartphone. and I mean, they're just they're remote control aircraft, but they're easy to fly. And I, uh, I said, this is my first, my first takeoff. I push that lever forward. To, the drone starts going up, and then it keeps going up. And I go, okay, good height. And I pulled it back. Nothing happens. Keeps going up. Fiddled with it. Pressed all the buttons. Keeps going up. It was like a helium balloon that you let go. It just kept going till it was a little dot in the sky and then disappeared. And I never saw that drone again. I have no idea what happened to it. <laughs> I just lost it. I looked around the neighborhood. Uh, you know, fortunately, it's very light. It's cheap drone, good news. It wouldn't have hurt anybody if it had fallen out of the sky. Chances are it's in a tree somewhere, but I never saw it again. Okay, round one, chalk it up to an experience. Went out and got the drone you cannot crash from a Parrot AR, who created this category, really, of smartphone drones. And really, these drones are based a lot on smartphone technology, the accelerometers, the small processors. So the Parrot AR, it was called the Bebop. I saw David Pogue, a Yahoo Tech. He did a great, how you can't, you can't go wrong with this. It can't crash. Crashed it immediately. First flight into a tree. It bent it somehow. And now from then on, every time I tried to take off, it would just flip over on its side. And that was that. So I thought, me and drones, we don't go together. I've wasted a lot of money now. I'm done. But see, I'm never really done. <laughs> My friend Alex Lindsay, who's a, a very talented video guy, said, oh, no, you're going to love this new from DJI, which is kind of the best known name in drones. These new uh, portable drones, they're so smart. And he convinced me to spend $1,000 on a, what um, it's called a Mavic Pro, and it folds up. In fact, you, you can carry it in a small uh, man purse sized pouch. Uh, it unfolds. Now, of course, I even though it may not legally be, be required, there seems to be some question about that because uh, of court cases. But I went to the FAA site, read all the rules, registered the drone, put the FAA number on the drone and everything. I want to be good. This thing has a very good quality 4K camera. You shoot 4K video. It's rock solid. I'm not going to say you can't crash it. You can. I can crash anything. I haven't crashed it yet, though. I've been flying it all week just blown away by the quality of the video I'm getting from this thing. And the fact that I can fold it up like this, that is pretty cool. What, one thing I will note is the technology, we're, you know, this is the fifth generation of drones at this point. The technology has come a long way. This thing will follow you. If you put it in, a, there's, there's a number of follow modes where it, it will continually point at you, it recognizes you point at a person, somebody on the skateboard, you point it, you touch the screen because it attaches to your iPhone or your Android phone, and you touch the screen and say, follow that. And then as you move the drone around, the camera follows that person, which just really makes for amazing, you know, movie quality shots. It also has a tracking mode where if you're a skier or a 
you know, a bicycler, you can have it follow you just above your head behind you as you bicycle. And it will just automatically follow you. Things like that. Gorgeous video. So uh, finally, I found a drone so far. Now, next week, ask me again. I can't crash so far. <laughs> this is the Mavic Pro from DJI. And I just love it that it's so portable and you can carry it over your shoulder, bring it with you on hikes and so forth. And I've, I've been able to get some great video. Really, really an amazing technology is Sounds silly when I say it, but technology is pretty cool. <laughs> it's been a while since I found something where I went, gee, this is space age. This is pretty amazing. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Hi, this is Bill Continelli, W2XOY with my sporadic RF musings. Way back in 1968, I had to spend a week in the hospital. I wasn't a ham then, but I was a casual CB'er and avid shortwave listener. Since my dad was chief pharmacist at Children's Hospital in Buffalo, we knew I was going to get a private room. I insisted on bringing my Panasonic RF 5000 radio. This so-called portable weighed 20 pounds and covered long wave, AM, FM, and short wave from 1.6 to 30 megacycles. I also brought my two watt, three channel Olsen CB walkie talkie and an AM pocket radio. I spent the week tuning in the BBC, Radio Moscow, and dozens of other countries on short wave, talking to my friends on CB, and listening to the top 40 on AM. I had a blast. In 1971, I again had to go to the hospital for a week. Again, I insisted on dragging that 20-pound Panasonic RF 5000 with me. I also had a 5-watt, 6-channel CB walkie-talkie. I had my general class license by then. I didn't have a 2-meter HT, but I did have a Lafayette VHF receiver that I used to monitor 2 meters as well as the local police fire frequencies. Again, I had a blast. Over the next 45 years, I've had many hospital stays ranging from one day to 10 weeks. In each case, I had radios with me. Recently, while on Facebook, I came across a post I made in September 2010, which said the following, quote, 12 hours to operation, suitcase packed, radio bag packed, a Linko dual band HT, Yesu Duo Band HT, Grundig AM-FM Shortwave Radio, Midland FRS GMRS Radio, Cell Phone, Batteries and Chargers, First Night Intensive Care, No Radios Allowed, Second Night, Talking Will Be 147.12 or 147.27, and for non-hams, FRS Channel 7, 462.7125, St. Peter's Hospital. Unquote. Yes, I remember that operation, and I remember the QSOs I had both on the amateur and FRS frequencies. From my own experiences, as well as those of other hams who have had hospital visits, I've learned a lot of lessons on how our hobby and our hospital stay can coexist. First, know the rules of the hospital or the rehab center. There is a sign in the lobby of our local hospital's emergency room that says, no two-way radios. I believe that sign refers to the emergency room only, not the hospital as a whole. I've stayed there many times with my radios with little or no trouble. One rehab center I stayed in had a very definite policy that all electronic devices, cell phones, computers, tablets, and radios had to be inspected and approved by the engineering staff. They said that they wanted to make sure that the electronic devices did not interfere with the medical equipment. This may sound absurd until you realize that many medical devices operate within our hand bands, especially the 420 to 450 megahertz and the 902 to 908 megahertz areas where we are secondary. For example, one heart monitor I wore operated on 434 megahertz. Second, pack light. A couple of multi-band HTs, an AM, FM, shortwave portable radio, a handheld scanner, and maybe an FRS, GMRS radio are all you need. 
In a recent hospital stay, I brought a Yesu VX5, a Yesu VX6, a Bofang Dual Band HT, a Kato AM FM shortwave radio, spare batteries, chargers, and high gain antennas. This gave me full receive coverage from 530 kilohertz through 900 megahertz, including HF SSB, transmit on 50, 144, 222, and 440 megahertz, and the MERS and FRS GMRS frequencies. Now, if your hospital stay will last several weeks, and if you will be ambulatory enough to go to an outside courtyard, you might want to bring a portable HF radio like the Yesu FT817. Otherwise, leave it at home. Third, know the frequencies you will need for your hospital stay. You may not be able to hit your favorite repeater from the hospital room. Find out what repeaters are in close proximity to your hospital. Remember, a hospital room is like a Faraday cage. Signals start to disappear more than five feet from the window. A high gain HT antenna in place of the pathetic rubber duck will help. I have a suction cup antenna mount. It attaches to the window and has eight feet of RG58 coax terminating in a BNC connector. It came in handy when I was tethered to an IV and on the bed and a chair alarm. You might want to also program the ambulance, EMS, and security frequencies for your hospital. They will provide entertaining listening when the repeaters are dead. Fourth, watch your radios. I'm not just talking about someone stealing them. I'm referring to doctors or nurses who will move your radios or shove them aside to use the available space. I know one ham in an extended hospital stay who lost a dual band Kenwood HT. The nurse quickly moved the table on which the HT was sitting. It fell to the floor, landed on the antenna, and snapped the SMA connector. Her response, it should not have been there. So, insist on moving the radios yourself. Fifth, promote amateur radio. Doctors and nurses will ask about the radios. Some will have knowledge of the hobby, having grown up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s during the CB craze. A few might have friends or relatives who are hams, but many under the age of 30 will have no clue what ham radio or even shortwave radio is. Through your explanations and your behavior as a patient, you can give our hobby a positive image. Sixth, deal with confrontation in a civilized way. Almost every doctor or nurse I saw was interested in my radios and was fascinated by what they could do. One nurse, however, insisted that I could use the radios to listen in on other patients' rooms. I explained over and over what ham radio was, what shortwave radio was, and emphasized that it was impossible to eavesdrop on anyone else's room. She was insistent that I put the radios away. I finally asked her calmly to get the doctor or the head nurse. She stormed out of the room. Fortunately, the other doctors and nurses knew me and my radios. I never heard anything about it again. Finally, there may be times when, for your own good, you temporarily cannot have your radios. You may be in the ICU or you may be incapacitated by illness or medication. In 2008, I had a serious operation. There were complications and I was in a coma for two weeks on morphine. When I awoke, I was confused, disoriented, delusional, and paranoid. I demanded my radios. My wife and the hospital refused to give them to me, and it turns out that was a good thing. My friend, the late, great Bill Barron, N2FNH, silent key, visited me and tape recorded me. When I recovered, I listened to the tape. If I had been on the repeaters talking like that, my license would have been revoked. If you are too weak, ill, or disoriented to actually get on the air, perhaps someone could set up a scanner so you could at least listen. So there you have it. Incidentally, I wrote this on Friday, August 18th, 2017, just one day after being discharged from the hospital. I spent two weeks there. I'm glad to be home. I hope that you never have a hospital stay, but if you do, remember to bring the radios. 
In my next sporadic RF musings, I will visit an old favorite, the radio bag. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. From the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Larry McGlore. KB9DIP, pileups? No, I'm not talking about the recent multi-vehicle collision on a nearby freeway the other day. I'm referring to pileups on the high-frequency bands when a hard-to-find DX station attracts scores of high-profile single sideband stations. According to inveterate Vermont contester and DXer Mitch Stern, W1SJ, there is an art to cracking pileups. How many of you guys on HF? And how many of you guys have dealt with a pileup? And how many of those hands up dealt with it successfully? Not quite as many. This is something that we should talk about because people run into it. You hear a big raging pileup, some big de-expedition on there. And the first thing you do is don't just dump your call sign in. Don't do that. Everyone does it. You really need to figure out what's going on, particularly it's a really big de-expedition. First off, are they working simplex or split? And I guarantee if they're working split and you don't know that and you go over their frequency, there's going to be 15 guys jumping all over you, beating the crap out of you. Okay, they're going to, they're going to say, he's up, he's up five, get off, you idiot. And then they'll, they'll all yell and scream and they'll jam out whoever is trying to talk. I'm aware that they're working split. I just forget to push the little button in on my radio. Then are they working by call area? If they say one land only and you're out in eight land, you have to wait. And, and they'll get mighty ticked off if you call in the wrong time. And then is the operator responding immediately or is he taking his time to go back to people? If he's responding immediately, only make one call. Only send your call sign once. It means he's, bang, he's picking up people immediately and going right back to them. If he's taking a while, it means he's probably a slower operator and he needs to digest a whole bunch of calls going back and forth. And then that's often the time where you want to make that wait and attack mode where you wait for everyone to call the first time and then you sneak in there when they're not looking. So timing your call is the most critical parameter. How critical is it? Guys running little stations beat guys running big stations because they're smart. That's how it works. It's called call when they ain't. When the guy goes, the, he gives his call saying it goes QRZ. Some people are calling before he even says QRZ. I don't know how they figure that out. How can the guy listen to you if he's still talking? So everyone's going to call immediately. And then there's going to be a lull after they all let up. And that's where you want to jump in. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people have learned that trick. So there's a lot of people that kind of wait for the second grouping and they'll call at the second time. You want to call, listen, call, listen, because you want to make sure you can hear the guy coming back. The problem with guys running DX on the same frequency is they often will get covered up by their own pileup. And that's why they work split. It's not, not so much to help pick out people. That may help, but what happens is he goes back to somebody and they're never going to hear him because everyone's yelling and screaming, particularly if his signal is weak. And as an operator, I've worked split from time to time, but the problem is it's a lot of overhead to work split. You have to now find two clear frequencies and make sure no one objects to it or complains or anything else. And so sometimes I just won't work split. I'll just stay on the same frequency and time my calls and then people get mad. You should be working split. I said, don't tell me what I got to do. You're not here. It's a little bit differently. So use your entire call sign. If you don't like your call sign, send the FCC some money and change it. But don't sit and send a couple of letters of your call sign because at the end of the pileup where I'm listening, that is not helping you. That will kind of put you to the back of the line. I hear call signs. I hear the whole call sign. I'll hear a prefix and a number and a suffix. And what I'm trying to do is get the most information and go back to as much as I can hear. If I go the Kilo Echo 8 Alpha, that kind of narrows it down quite a bit. I'm not going to just say the 8 station go ahead because I'm just going to have everyone out in Ohio and everything call me. So it, it, giving me more information is better than not. And you also want to avoid descriptors like QRP and mobile and your state. First of all, I don't care whether you're QRP or not, <laughs> or whether you're QRO or, or what your status is or whether you're single or married. Just give your call sign. That's what I'm really concerned about is what the call sign is. And the same thing whether you're mobile or not. I mean, sometimes I'll say mobile when I'm talking to somebody. Sometimes just have fun with it. And the state, it normally doesn't matter except in one exception. When I'm in the sweepstakes, what's the hardest section to work for you guys? Yukon, VY1 for me, right? It's like halfway around the world from where I live. 
very, very tough for me to work. I have to get through a whole wall of sixes to get out there. But the guy out there, he needs Vermont as bad as I need Yukon. And so when I hear Jay on DOI 1 JA or who's ever operating his station, I'll just yell Vermont and nothing else. Vermont! <laughs> and he hears that and he knows it's me and goes back to me. That will not work if you yell Ohio. I can guarantee you that. Listen, listen, listen. Sometimes it's tough. The DX stations are very hard to hear. They're in the noise and whatever. So if you cannot hear them, then don't call them. Because if you can't hear them, then you're not going to hear him going back to you. Never call out of turn or do what we call tail ending, where the guy finishes with somebody and then you come in on the tail like that. If you do that with me, I will simply ignore you. If you do it enough times, I will blacklist you, meaning that I will not go back to you ever. Okay, that, that's just rude. If, if I went back to somebody calling out of turn, guess what? Everyone does it and I have a mess. And one of the things as the person running the pileup is law and order is paramount. If, if you lose control of the pileup, and you see it all the time, where literally the pileup just blows up and you can't control it. It's like letting the animals out of the zoo all at once. And I'm trying to work people as fast as possible. That's not an advantageous thing for me. So I wanted to go right along, bang, 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 which means that when I get a pileup, I want to pick out a call sign as fast as I can, go back to them before people get upset. And I can actually keep a pileup running along at a fairly good clip where people are not getting frustrated. If you're taking too long, people get frustrated. They start mouthing off. They start complaining and jamming the whole thing. You don't want to do that. That's not fun anymore. So you want to discourage that. And I'll tell people if they do it enough times, do not call out a turn. I will not go back to you. And then they stop doing it. It's okay to respond, though, if like the call's like one letter off. Like I go back to a Kilo Echo 6 and it was really a Kilo Echo 5 or something like that. All right, you know, I, I messed up. That's fine. But if I go back to somebody who has a Kilo Echo 6 in it and you're a W1, that's not even close. And you shouldn't really do that. Avoid comments and criticisms, not only on the air. I don't care what the, you know, if you want to send a critique, email it to me. Don't send it to me in the middle of the thing. It's rude. And, you know, I'm busting my hump to make whatever it is I'm located at available to you as best as I can. Don't sit there and rag on me about it. I can very easily turn the radio off. And in fact, I ran the group that ran W1AW Portable One in Vermont. And I told people, I says, if, if the pileup gets unruly, people get nasty, turn the radio off, go away, and they will stop doing it. Then you won't get to hear the criticisms. And especially on the clusters, guess what? We all look at the cluster, and someone said, hey, stupid, work split, and when they were spotting me. And I noted the call sign, and I basically ignored them for the next three hours. And finally, I finally went back to them. I worked them, and then I sent them an email. Hey, don't you ever, ever comment like that to me in public. If you, if you want to send me an email directly, fine, you know, I'll ignore you, but don't do that. And they said, well, it wasn't me, it was my buddy, he was bootlegging my call, I, I don't know. <laughs> it was just rude, and I didn't like it. The cluster should be for telling people what frequency someone's on, not giving your personal opinions anyway. Pick your battles wisely. So if you've got a little 100-watt station with a dipole, do not try and get on the first hour of the big D expedition and think you're going to break the pileup. You probably will not. There are guys with really big stations who you're going up against. I don't even try and do that because, yeah, my tri banner doesn't even match wits with some of these guys with these antenna farms. So the start time will be the roughest time, but if it's a contest... Come back on Sunday afternoon where these guys are begging, literally begging, and then it's very easy to do it. Sometimes you'll hear people close into you, like in Indiana or across Ohio. That's called working scatter, like on 20 meters or 15. But that's a mode that you need high power for. That's not something you're going to do on low power. And then the really important thing is have the right attitude. If you don't succeed, try again. Keep doing it. Set in your mind how much time you want to donate to sitting there calling this guy, and he may never come back to you. But you know what? You're not going to work them by giving up. Usually, persistence does pay off. And if you get frustrated, you say, oh, these guys are jerks. They're all morons. They're all calling out. Turn the radio off. Go for a walk. First, it'll be better for you physically. You'll get a little exercise. And if you're like me and your memory is only lasts about five minutes, you'll forget what got you so annoyed in the first place. And that concludes this excerpt from a 2017 Dayton Hamvention talk by Vermont contester and DXer Mitch Stern, W1SJ, on the art of cracking pileups on the high-frequency handbands. And I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP. 
We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Club Log author Michael Wells, G7VJR, announced on February 13th that he has completed the great hardware shuffle for the online service. The free web-based tool can produce DXCC league tables, expedition tools, log search services, and most wanted lists. In recent months, I have been working through a checklist to do a big once-every-five-year kind of upgrade for Club Log's hardware, Wells said in a January post. The upgraded system now is back up and running after being briefly offline. The work involved pulling the Club Log primary hardware to replace CPUs, upgrade memory, and update solid state drives. Club Log was moved temporarily onto the Google Computer Cloud, which already serves as a backup, Wells explained, and was halted together during database swaps to keep the databases absolutely pristine. Wells said he appreciates those who donate to keep Club Log going. He requests those having questions about Club Log to use the reflector or the help desk. As of February 13th, Wells was wrapping up a few loose ends. I hope you're all making lots of QSOs instead of looking at stats, he remarked. Sorry for the extended work. I shall have square eyes after this is done, Wells indicated. This week that the club log will stop accepting HTTP and redirect to HTTPS very soon. The Perseverance DX Group reports that its plans to activate the protected marine area of Ducey Island from October 20th to November 3rd, 2018, they're starting to gel. The last Ducey Island D expedition was VP6DX in 2008. Ducey is currently the 21st most wanted DXCC entity, according to Club Log. The 2018 D expedition would operate as VP6D. A team of 15 operators will be on the island for up to 14 days, departing from Manjera, French Polynesia, aboard the expedition ship Braveheart. Seven of the operating positions are planned for 160 to 10 meters, Sideband, CW, and digital, including FT8. VP6D has added 6-meter Earth-Moon-Earth to the mix and hopes to make the first ever 6-meter moon bounce contact from Ducey Island. The logistics plan coming together, the team announced on February 8th. Our equipment will be consolidated in Fremont, California for testing, packaging, and shipment to the Braveheart in New Zealand. The team reported its antenna plans are coming together with two-element vertical dipole arrays on the high bands backed up by a couple of horizontal beams, four squares on the 30 and 40 meters, and verticals on the 80 and 160. Top band receive antennas are still under deployment. A grant from Northern California D Expedition Foundation, as well as contributions from other DX orgs, are helping to fund the Adventures Clubs and Foundations. It's believed this would be the fourth D Expedition to Ducey Island, an uninhabited atoll. Ducey Island is a British overseas territory in the Pitcairn Islands in the South Pacific. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, February 16th. The single sunspot we talked about last week will soon disappear, but it's going out with a bang. A couple of days ago, it exploded with a coronal mass ejection that was predicted to strike us yesterday and continue well into today. If we're lucky, conditions on the HF bands will settle down in time for the CW portion of the ARRL International DX contest this weekend. As always, if HF conditions deteriorate, the low bands are your best choices. On VHF and UHF, we have a major weather system marching across the central United States, and we're getting reports of band openings from Texas all the way to Michigan. This is likely to spread into New England and the mid-Atlantic states over the next few days. VHF enthusiasts in northern Florida should keep a sharp lookout for tropo openings in that area as well. As part of its educational outreach through the Education and Technology Program, ARRL will offer three sessions of the Teachers Institute on Wireless Technology this July. The week-long workshops will be held at ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut and in Dayton, Ohio hosted by the Dayton Amateur Radio Association, the Teachers Institute, or TI. It's an expenses-paid professional development seminar that provides teachers at all grade levels with tools and strategies to introduce basic electronics, radio science, space technology, and satellite communication, as well as weather science, introduction to microcontrollers, and basic robotics in their classroom. 
The Teachers Institute curriculum is designed for motivated teachers and other school staff who want to learn more about wireless technology and bring that knowledge to their students. The goal of the TI program is to equip educators with necessary foundational knowledge as through hands-on learning generate the inspiration for teachers to continue exploring wireless technology and adapt what they learn to their classroom curricula. Interested educators can apply online. The $100 enrollment fee is refunded for applicants who have not selected. A qualified applicant must be an active teacher at an elementary, middle, high school, or community college, or in a leadership enrichment instruction role in an after-school program. Topics covered in the TI-1 Introduction to Wireless Technology include basic electronics, radio science, microcontroller programming, and basic robotics. Among other activities, participants will learn how to solder and practice by building small projects. They'll also learn basic circuit concepts and learn how to use basic test equipment. In addition, TI-1 attendees will learn about amateur radio and take part in a hidden transmitter hunt, see demonstrations of amateur radio satellite communication, and build and program their own simple robots. The TI-2 Remote Sensing and Data Gathering Workshop will concentrate on analog to digital conversion and data sampling. Participants will receive telemetry from amateur radio satellites and apply it to math and science topics. T1-2 participants will also construct a marine research buoy equipped with environmental sensors, build a microcontroller to sample data, configure it for automatic packet reporting, and receive and upload data from a spreadsheet for analysis. Holding an amateur radio license is not required for the Introduction to Wireless Technology Workshop, but one is required for those planning to attend the Advanced Remote Sensing and Data Gathering Workshop, TI-2, where applicants for advanced workshop must have completed TI-1. The grant to attend a TI covers transportation, hotel, a modest per diem allowance to cover meals, and a resource library of relevant ARRL publications. Graduate credit is available through Fresno Pacific University, which may be applied to satisfy professional growth requirements to maintain teaching credentials. The class is self-contained, and participants are expected to be able to complete all requirements during class time. Graduate credit forms may be requested at the end of the Teachers Institute. For more information, contact Allie Riedel at ARRL Headquarters. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. And finally this week, with technologies of all sorts having invaded our lives in every domain, it is interesting to see how new technologies are being developed that exploit existing technologies as if they were part of nature instead of man-made. Wi-Fi is a good example. Because Wi-Fi access points are everywhere, navigation systems can use databases of Wi-Fi access points to accurately calculate their position. Wi-Fi access points thus have reached the status of landmarks. Another emerging technology based on Wi-Fi signals is Wi-Fi backscatter communication where passive objects use the Wi-Fi signals surrounding them to send information to a receiver in a way similar to a mirror reflecting sunlight. Since Wi-Fi signals are reflected by objects, they can superimpose information on the signal by modulating their reflectivity. A receiver can detect the object and extract the information by comparing the Wi-Fi signals it receives over different paths. Without modulation, all the packets should contain the same information, whereas modulated reflections are different and therefore detectable. Researchers from the University of Washington have developed 3D printable objects capable of modulating their Wi-Fi reflectivity. Using their methods, they create smart, passive objects that transmit information about their state without requiring energy or electronic parts. By integrating a 3D printable antenna in an object, its RF reflectivity becomes controllable. Mechanical motion like a flowing fluid or pressure on a button can change the object's RF reflection properties in a controlled way, for instance by connecting and disconnecting the antenna. Like Morse code in telegraphy, a dented wheel can push a button to short the object's antenna according to a predefined sequence. This modulates the object's RF signal reflection in such a way that a receiver can detect it. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association.
This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.